right. All right, so we'll be talking about the eight Mahayana precepts specifically tonight. And uh, before we do that, we'll just set our motivation like normally. And so just take a minute and uh, gather your attention and we'll use the refuge in Bodhicitta prayer. Sange chodon sogi chodam nai danchu padu dani kapsu chi dagi chunyan gi pe sonam gi rola penche sange drupa sho sange chodom sogi chodam nai danchu padu dani kapsu chi dagi chunyan gi pe sonam gi Rola penche sange drupa sho sange churum sogi churam na janju padu dani kapsu chi dagi chunyan gi pe sonam gi rola penche sange drupa sho and just allowing that motivation to sink in and revive. Okay, so in this session, I'm going to go through what the eight Mahayana precepts are. Um, I'll be going through the ceremony itself. I'll be going through kind of the benefits of this practice and its origins. And then I'm going to make sure we have plenty of time for questions. If you guys want to flesh out little nitty gritty details, I'm really happy to do that. So this is in preparation for his, um, for Jado Rinpoche offering the eight Mahayana precepts soon at Matripa College. But this, this uh, explanation kind of applies anywhere. Um, the eight Mahayana precepts are a practice that are offered at many Dharma centers, often twice a month on the full moon and the new moon days. And they're just 24 hour vows, but they're incredibly powerful. And it's a really rich practice to kind of start weaving into your cycle of practices. So, um, so I hope that you guys find it interesting and enjoyable and um, please save your questions. I definitely want to talk about any things that you're stuck on or confused about. Um, hopefully by just kind of going through it, a lot of it will be answered. Um, and I'll go through the ceremony briefly as well, just so you're kind of oriented. Sometimes the ceremony is led 100% in Tibetan. And the teacher is just reciting in Tibetan and you're kind of like, I don't know Tibetan, what do I do? And in that case, if you're on board and you know what the ceremony is, you just muddle along the best you can with your mental attitude being, I agree, I accept. Yeah, so you repeat as best as you can with your you know, terrible accent and your gibberish, but your intention is the main thing here. So you think, I agree, I accept, and you just repeat as best as you can. Sometimes they'll have someone reciting the practice in English, either together with the Tibetan Lama or before or after. So sometimes they'll have the English woven right into the ceremony. If it's a group of only English speaking people, it's going to be only in English, unless there's some prayers that we just like to do in Tibetan. So there'll be a grand mixture. But just so you know, if there is the case where it's only in Tibetan and you're feeling a little bit lost, you will have now looked at the English, you know what's being said, you know what's going on, and uh, you can just think in your heart you agree. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. All right, so I made you all a PowerPoint. This might help clarify things. Um, this particular presentation tonight, I'm using a few different sources. I think it's really important to always name your sources. So I'm just trying to practice what I preach here. Um, I've got the benefits of protecting the eight Mahayana precepts, restoring broken vows and purifying negative karma by His Holiness Trijong Rinpoche, Dorji Chan. Um, a little bit from the collected works, the commentary by Trusong Rinpoche. And a great deal of this is based on the oral teachings of my root guru, Kensa Rinpoche Geshe Chashi Sering, and some things from the commentary of the Eight Mahayana Precepts by Venerable Chukjin Children. So just kind of an aside of, of where the source of this information is coming from. Okay, so just kind of getting us a little bit excited about it. What is the benefit of this practice? These one day vows, just one day, what is the benefit of these? The benefit is enlightenment. It plants the seed for enlightenment. 
And here's a quote from Shakyamuni Buddha himself about them. He's talking to one of his disciples and he says, Goshinka, by protecting the eight Mahayana precepts on the eighth and 15th days of the month, meaning the new moon and the full moon, during the month of the Buddha's great miraculous deeds, this is one of the holy months within the Buddhist calendar, one attains no less than Buddhahood. So while we do these during special holy months or during special days of the month, you can do them at any time. And they're always planting seeds for enlightenment. Um, the Buddha also said in the King of Concentration Sutra, for 10 billion eons, equaling the number of sand grains in the Pacific Ocean, if one offers umbrellas, flags, garlands of light offerings, food and drink with a calm mind, or offers service to 100 billion times 10 million Buddhas, when the Holy Dharma has become extremely perished and the teachings of the Gonda Bliss One have stopped, if somebody who is enjoying living in one vow for one day or night, this merit particularly exalted than having made all those offerings. So the Buddha is saying there is going to be times when things are difficult. And if you were to make tons and tons of offerings during those times, it's of great merit. But if you just live in these vows for one day, the merit is even more than that. So this is just some um, nice helpful things to know. This is from Venerable Tubden Shudran, one of the singer, senior uh, nuns in our tradition. Um, the benefit of observing these precepts is that one accumulates a great amount of merit in a short time. One will receive upper realm rebirths and eventually will attain awakening. One is protected from harm and the place where one lives becomes peaceful and prosperous. One's mind is peaceful and calm. One gains control over one's bad habits. There are fewer distractions when meditating. One gets along better with others. One will meet the Buddhist teachings in the future and can be born as a disciple of Maitreya Buddha. So that sounds great. Here's the advertising, right? The advertising section. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think what's important to understand here is this is not totally divorced from what you already know to be true which is that promises have power. You might already be a nice person, already refraining from harm, but the more intention you bring to it, the more power it's gonna have. The more conscious and decisive the choice is, the more power it's gonna have. And your reason for it is gonna add power as well. So these are things you already know. So it's all well and good to read these quotes and to think of this kind of like Dharma advertising, but really apply it in terms of your own logic and think about why might that be true. And you can think about kind of times in your life where you've made gentle but decisive commitments for a short period of time and the way it's made your mind feel more vast. Take something really basic like you had to organize a dinner party. Yeah, just you had to organize a dinner party. And your commitment was, I want the people at the dinner party to feel happy and nourished and warm. Yeah, and that was your only commitment. Nothing so big song and dance, right? You just wanted everyone to be happy and nourished and warm. And you set your motivation, not even realizing that's what you were doing. You were just really thinking of the people coming to your home. And in thinking of the people coming to your home, you might have a headache that day. You might be tired that day. You might have a lot going on in your life that day. But because you're thinking of them, a lot of your own baggage kind of fades to the background because of the power of your commitment for this one event. If you had experiences like that where you did have stuff going on, but because you were consciously in this caring atmosphere, trying to create a certain space and connection for people, your stuff settled. Yeah, and similarly, when you take vows like this, a lot of the kind of superficial, piddly nonsense that distracts us in our day-to-day -day life fades. Or, strangely, sometimes it can get worse because it's like aggressively trying to pull your focus. But in either case, it becomes a really interesting exercise in self-awareness and self-knowing. So one of the vows is not to lie. And you might not be a big fibber anyway, 
Yeah, you might have grown out of your tendencies to exaggerate. You might not be a bald faced liar so much now. You might occasionally exaggerate, but it's not your thing. But now that you've made a vow not to kill, or excuse me, a vow not to lie just for one day, suddenly you find these urges to kind of embellish or you find yourself kind of um, getting on a roll with something and kind of like skirting around the truth or something. And you think, what is wrong with me? Normally I'm not like this. But in a way it kind of invites you to look at yourself by being so decisive about things that you already care about. So, um, there's a direct message from Zach. He says, uh, I think I was confused the Mahayana vows for the five precepts. Um, oh, okay. So he's jumped off because he was curious about the five lay vows as opposed to the eight Mahayana vows. Yep, so he's hopped off. No worries, they are different. <laughs> they are related, but they are different. Yep, no worries. I could make you a Venn diagram, but I'm sure you can figure it out. <laughs> Alrighty, so we'll just kind of keep going with these, but I think it's interesting to kind of take this uh, elevated language that you hear in sutras and this kind of devotional speech that can sometimes be triggering and just bring it home to your real life experience of what might be true there. So continuing on just some rough guidelines, whoever you first take the eight Mahayana precepts from does become your guru, one of your gurus. It doesn't have to be your only one, but you are making a guru disciple relationship. So because of this, Lama Zopa Rinpoche says, if the student is not ready or confident to make that commitment to that person, then it is better for the student to take the precepts from the altar until they're ready to take them from someone who they're willing to accept as their guru. So this is good general advice because sometimes we might really want a practice, but the person giving that practice, we don't know them yet. And we just think, oh, surely they're fine. They have the word Rinpoche after their name or they're a Tibetan or they're wearing robes. And that is not a good enough reason to trust someone with your practice, is it, <laughs> right? Like it's a good you know, recipe to start, but you still wanna do your own checking. Yeah, so you're making a very strong karmic connection with anyone that you take vows from, even one day vows. Yeah, even one day vows, if you're taking them from someone in the sense that they say them and you're answering back, not a group practice where there's just a chanting leader, but you're really obviously taking them from someone, you are making that guru disciple relationship, which could be fantastic news if it's a teacher you've been wanting to connect with on that level. But if it's someone very new to you, I would really caution you to give it time and check. Yeah, give it time and check and to not sort of fall into a kind of a naivete or a gullibleness that assumes that someone who looks the part is a holy being or someone that looks the part has a basis of ethics. Maybe they do, but you know, anywhere that there is power, there will be people who abuse power. Yeah, we know this from our life, yeah. So we don't wanna kind of suddenly become naive and throw out all our common sense just cause we're in this spiritual realm. Yeah, in this kind of like religious context, we still wanna do that really common sense, healthy skepticism with folks. And it is a really strong karmic connection. So this isn't to say that you can't like go to classes with someone that you don't know. Of course, go to classes and check them out, see if you like their style. So I think it's just one of these things where, there can be a peer pressure at Dharma centers and a lot of hype around a big Lama and you feel like, oh, I must, I must, I must. But it actually um, can wind up biting you in the bum later down the track because you realize, oh, they're great, but they're not really right for me. Or you realize they're not great. <laughs> yeah, so better to just give it some time. Yeah, I'm probably preaching to the choir, but it feels like it needs to be said. Yeah, especially because like, you know, for example, Jada Rinpoche giving eight Mahayana precepts, I'm gonna say, oh, just do it, he's amazing. Just do it, he's amazing and ruin my own advice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you still have to do your own checking, you know, and it's not enough that people you are friends with like them. You have to see if you have the connection there. And if you feel any, red flags or warnings, or if you've read anything disturbing, you just wanna make sure you investigate. 
that's not to say you want to like leave it forever because you know death is coming like let's get the show on the road but you know just make sure you don't kind of get swept up into a peer pressure thing okay so that's that note um so it is fine to take the precepts from the altar so although of course having the lineage makes it stronger and connects you more directly to the guru and the lineage still you are taking and keeping precepts when you take them from the altar like with your little buddha statue and your you know text and your stupa and you really think that you're taking these precepts it still does have power and does have an effect so traditionally the very first time you do this practice it's done from a spiritual mentor and that connects you with the lineage and then thereafter one can do the ceremony before a buddha image by regarding it as the actual buddha but even before then, you know, you can kind of ease your way into the practice and start getting used to it. So here's a point that's kind of interesting, which is that you can take the eight Mahayana precepts before you have actually officially taken refuge. In fact, with faith, taking the eight Mahayana precepts is taking refuge in the heart sense. So anyone who has faith and is sincere is in fact the heart taking refuge. So it's okay if you haven't done that formal refuge ceremony yet, you can go ahead and take eight Mahayana precepts if you like. All right, so before we do the vows specifically, are there questions so far before we go, to go through them one by one? Or things that you've seen or heard at Dharma centers related to this practice that you wanted to unpack a little? Um, I am really unfamiliar with them and I signed up to do them, but I'm really thinking this is so interesting. I don't think I'm quite prepared to do them. I think I need to, um, it's interesting when you said that will be your guru. I don't know enough about him. So I really do appreciate what it is that you've told me. I think I will choose not to do the precepts mm -hmm. and, um, uh, wait but this is so interesting. Thank you for all of the information, so. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, and it could be that once you meet him, it's really obvious you have a connection or you might look at some stuff online ahead of time and be like, yeah, I think that's one of my, one of my gurus. It's not like it's, he has to be your only one, but that hesitancy you feel, I think that is a good thing to kind of explore for sure. And just kind of see is it hesitancy around the practice eight manihana peace sets or is it hesitancy around the person that you're connecting with or both and just kind of sit with it and and again it's that delicate balance of don't leave it forever death is coming but also don't feel rushed and don't feel peer pressure because your practice is your own you know it's your heart it's your life it's your pacing yeah I've been really driven the last little while to find a place to take refuge. And this is something that was just offered and I didn't really understand exactly what it was. Mm. So um, that's why I, I think, I think I need to know more, have more information and yeah. be better prepared for it. Yeah, so, definitely. Uh, yeah, no, definitely. No, there's no rush. Um, and Kristen was asking her video is not working as well. Um, Jada Rinpoche, when he leaves Portland, um, let's see, I'm just reading this. So she knows um, Jada Rinpoche via the internet and others' positive interactions. Um, and would you say that, you know, when you first meet him, that it's correct to kind of check then and then and positive to proceed? So you know, these interactions that we have with llamas online, just kind of watching YouTube videos, they can be really powerful. They can be really significant, especially the live ones. So if you've been following him online for a while and have a heart connection from those teachings, you know, kind of lean into that. That's something telling about your connection. And then when you meet him in person, just, you know, kind of sit with it. Maybe kind of talk to your heart about it a little bit and see if you get kind of a nudge either way, a little wait a while nudge or a um, yeah, dive right in nudge. It's sometimes difficult to distinguish between emotional enthusiasm about the path and what is the person. And if you're just kind of hungry and seeking to fill a void 
or if you're coming from a place of wisdom and real inspiration. And I think only you know, only you are gonna know that. And so just kind of sitting with once you meet him in person, is that same connection there? Is it something that you wanna go more further with? Just, you know, test it out, test the waters. Yeah, test the waters. I mean, someone like Jada Rinpoche is an easier Lama in some ways because he's in the public eye so much. He's been vetted very thoroughly um, by lots of people that we respect. Um, but that's not to say that there aren't Lamas who have big names who fall through the cracks and wind up being a bit dodgy or Lamas who are completely perfect, but just not perfect for you, you know, as an individual, right? It's just not ringing your bell. So it's, it's really something that you don't want to put off thinking about it, but it is okay to put off making the connection, but don't put off thinking about it because this is a really important piece of our life and our spiritual practice, the connection with the teachers, you know, so find yourself some quiet time, write it out or talk it out with a Dharma friend or just sit with it of where is my wish for connection coming from? Is it coming from an affliction and an attachment and a want to fill the void? Or is it coming from deep inspiration and wisdom and realizing this is the point where I'm at in my development? You know, just kind of tease it out. Um, we've got to have those deep thoughts. Yeah. Yeah, so gently, gently. Um, I don't know if that answered your question. Kristen, if you want to write a follow-up in the chat, please do. And um, I'll keep going, but I'll have an eye on the chat in case. So we're just gonna go through them. And again, these are just 24 hours, right? These are not lifetime vows, but they are very powerful to take for 24 hours. So the first four are your classics, which are similar to the lay vows. There are reasons why they're different and we're gonna go into those later. So the first is to refrain from killing directly or indirectly any living thing. The second is to refrain from stealing and taking things without the permission of their owner. You know, taking what hasn't been freely offered. The third is to refrain from sexual contact and all sexual activities. And the fourth is to refrain from lying and deceiving others. So, you know, intellectually, these are very easy to understand. Experientially, you might have a varying degree of relationship with those. Then the second set is to refrain from intoxicants, alcohol, tobacco, recreational drugs. It's okay to take prescriptions. Refraining from intoxicants is like a support because it's not that intoxicants are good or bad, they're ethically neutral. But under their influence, we might do more negative things and with an unclear mind, we might do more negative things. Um, number six is to refrain from eating more than one meal that day. And this is the one that people often get stuck on, even though the other ones are quite profound. It's like, what do you mean one meal? And if you know yourself to have um, problematic blood sugar or you know a health situation that can't quite cope with that, then maybe the practice of precepts isn't for you, but it's only for one day. So the meal is traditionally taken before noon or before the midday point. And once you stop eating for 30 minutes, you are done with that meal, no more food the rest of the day. The rest of the day you can have you know, water, no problem, light drinks like uh, apple juice, but nothing undiluted whole milk or fruit juice with pulp, no smoothies. And we also do the practice of avoiding what are called black foods. So meat, chicken, fish, eggs, onions, garlic, radishes. These are all, um, you know, they have an influence on your inner energy system, they have an influence on your digestion, and they're good to avoid on days that you're really practicing things like this. Um, you'll see this list in Kriya Tantra practices, Action Tantra, like Medicine Buddha, Chenrezig, etc. There's also this recommendation to refrain from black foods. Then seven and eight are going to be the ones that maybe surprise you, I don't know to refrain from sitting on a high expensive bed or seat with pride also to avoid sitting on animal skins and eight is to refrain from wearing jewelry perfume and makeup to refrain from singing dancing or playing music with attachment okay so i'll unpack those a little bit 
Um, so it's completely okay to drink tea and water throughout the day of your vow. It's just when you drink tea, make sure it's not more than half milk, like a super, super thick chai or something. Make sure it's just a splash of milk in your tea. Um, caffeine's okay, but just don't go crazy with your caffeine. It's not considered an intoxicant in our school of thought, although I'm sure all of us have had too much coffee and gotten the jitters and have tipped it into intoxicant land. So, you know, moderation. But um, so tea and coffee are fine. Um, I'll go into the reasons why those vows and the benefit of those vows in a second. But just logistically, when you're looking at not killing, not stealing, not lying, I think those are pretty obvious. Yeah, just don't do those. <laughs> yes. And when you're looking at intoxicants, I think it would make sense why they would disturb mental clarity and make it easier to do non-virtue. Now, things like the high expensive bed, what's the deal there? Things like the perfume and things like that. This is where people are kind of like, is that just tradition or what's the deal? But I think it's interesting to like, think of yourself if you've been sitting in your best chair in your living room with lots of other people, friends and family, and like say there's so many people that you've had to drag random chairs from other rooms and like somebody sitting on like a low footstool, like an ottoman or something. And you know, there's like differences in levels. If you're sitting kind of holding court in the big fancy armchair, you know, your nice plush squishy one that's got all the good cushions, you can feel sort of a subtle pride creep in just from the posture and the physicality. And then if you have to get up and someone takes your seat, you're like a little affronted. And it's all very silly and very subtle, but these physical postures can have an impact on our mind. Now, if they don't have an impact on your mind, that's a whole nother case. So if your bed in your room is a gigantic high bed that you've been sleeping on for 20 years and it does not trigger pride for you, you don't have to suddenly sleep on the floor. Yeah. It's just really recognizing this with pride, yeah? Where you're sitting in the day, just to be a little bit conscious of, does this physicality, does this posture invite a mental state that is not the path I want to follow? Yeah, and it might be that this is not particularly one of your problematic things that you have to worry about in life, but it's an interesting thing because it's not something we often think about how you sit or how you stand, being a catalyst for a way of thinking. But you know, if you've been to any kind of like movement workshop, yoga stuff, that your mind does respond to what your body is doing. Like if you're all kind of hunched over and looking down, you can start to feel tired and a little depressed and a little lowly. And if you put your shoulders back and you're standing kind of heroically, you can feel sort of more confident and it has an effect, doesn't it? So it's just kind of worth kind of playing with are there postures, are there places in my house that do trigger pride? Or are they ways of sitting in my space that do trigger pride and avoiding those? So it's completely fine if your bed is not a problematic thing in terms of your pride. Don't suddenly like put your back out sleeping on an air mattress or something. You know, just common sense. The real thing is about pride. Yep. And um, yeah, and Kristen was saying we are trying to get out of the perspective of being above others. Exactly. Yeah, we're trying not to have that like looking down attitude. And then the perfume and the jewelry and these things, they can evoke opulence and pride, but they also can trigger attachment or kind of a partner seeking behaviors that we might not even recognize. You know, we might have been married for many years and still kind of do these behaviors that are subtly to attract. Um, they, they can be performative. They can be, you know, war paint. There's lots of reasons for adorning ourselves. Some of them are dominating. Some of them are, you know, lustful. Some of them are just habit, but kind of making a, a bit of a, a outer renunciation affect also can stabilize and clear your mind and make things just a bit more simple. So if you're very used to wearing makeup every day, it can be quite confronting not to if you're out and about not wearing makeup, but it also can be quite freeing. The question usually comes up, what about soap? What about deodorant? What about shampoo that has a little bit of perfume in it as opposed to like adding cologne or adding perfume? And the advice of my teachers has always been use things that keep you clean, but try and avoid the most perfumey things if you can. The main thing is about avoiding attachment.
Yeah. And like in terms of your jewelry, you can keep wearing your wedding ring. You know, that's not so much adornment as commitment signaling. <laughs> yeah. Commitment single signaling is good. Um, but, you know, earrings, necklaces, bracelets, all that kind of stuff. If you can take those off for the day, that's um, it can help your mind. So these are not huge issues. The real issue is avoiding pride, avoiding attachment. These outer things are to help you support that. Are there, are there questions about any of those valves? I can put them back on the screen and then you can um, unmute yourself if you see one that you wanna unpack more. They're all pretty straightforward. Uh, the singing, dancing, playing music also is with attachment. You know, these being things that can kind of stir up the brain, stir up the mind, get us into kind of a nostalgic attachment, desire-y, distracted-y kind of headspace. They can also be related to performance and pride, these kind of things. Um, it's not like singing, dancing, and playing music are bad. They're not. But um, sometimes because of them, the mind gets swept away. And so we refrain from those. It makes it a lot easier to concentrate. There's a question in the chat. Um, let's see. Can I wear a necklace that is a pearl on a string which signifies to me my practice? Is it okay to wear? Um, I am attached to this single pearl. I mean, I think it's worth sitting with, but I would hide it. Yeah, if you feel like you must wear it because it really reminds you of compassion or something, put it under your shirt so it's not like an adornment that you're showing off to others. Yeah, under the clothes. Um, yeah, yeah, other kind of logistical issues around the vows. Clear enough? Yeah. Cool. All right. All right, we'll keep on going. Okay, so to actually break the vows, you need these four conditions. So you have to want to, right? Number one, the motivation is a destructive attitude, such as attachment, anger, etc. cetera. Um, there is an object of the action. For example, a being that is killed or an object that is stolen. You actually do the thing. You don't just think about doing the thing, you actually go ahead and do it. Or you tell someone else to do it on your behalf. And then it happens, it's completed. The being dies or you think this is mine or whatever related to each vow. So these four conditions must be present for you to actually break the vow. Um, so it actually takes you know, a lot. It, it's not gonna be an accidental thing. So you take, for example, cleaning your kitchen and there's a little ant on the countertop and you wipe over the ant. If you see the ant and think, I don't like that ant on my countertop, that's rubbish to me, wipe, that breaks the vow. But if you don't see the ant, it was accidental, it doesn't break the vow. You know, so in both cases, the ant lost their life. In both cases, you were the condition for the ant losing their life, but it's only breaking the vow if you meant to. You saw it and meant to, yeah. Um, let's see, and you know, other examples would be, if you, I don't know, <laughs> saw something at the shops, you wanted it, you were thinking of stealing it, you know, you're a, you're a stealthy shoplifter, you know, we're all, well, as if any of us are, but say you're a, a shoplifter, you, you think about it, you want to, you move towards it, but then you catch yourself and don't. You haven't brought, broken the vow, have you? So just the thought isn't doing anything. Yeah. The thought, I mean, it, I shouldn't say it's not doing anything. It is creating mental habits that can be unfortunate, but it's not doing anything in terms of the vow itself. Yeah, that makes sense. So then what happens if all four branches are complete and you totally did break one of the vows? It's a big, heavy karma. It really is a very heavy karma. If it's gonna be such a huge benefit to take these vows, of course, it's gonna be a corresponding negative karma to break them, but it's not the end of the world. There's a way to purify that. And it's within the practice itself. It's within the ceremony itself. There's a mantra called the Dharani of Immaculate Morality. The Dharani of Immaculate Morality is within the Eight Mahayana Precepts booklet practice text itself. 
and you recite that 21 times with strong regret for having broken that vow. And that really does act as a remedy and restoration. So even if you do break them, there's a remedy. It's important that you don't let it slide because you want this practice to have the power. Yeah, you really want this practice to have the positive effect it can. So if you do clean the counter and wipe over an ant on purpose, or you're vacuuming and you vacuum up some spiders, or, you know, it's really the wrong thing, stop, look up that little mantra, do it. Yeah, do it right away. Do it that day. Don't let it sit. Yeah. And then, you know, no guilt, no shame moving on. Yeah. Don't make a whole song and dance out of it. Just, okay, done. Because of course we're going to make mistakes. We've got all sorts of habits from our life so far. So is that kind of making sense? What it takes to break them and what it takes to restore it if you do break it and purify it if you do break it? Yeah. Yeah. Nancy. It kind of shows me how serious this is and how powerful it is. So yeah, very good, very good. Nice to know about it. Yeah, it's a powerful practice. It, it really is. Um, I, I recommend it a lot. And I mean, monks and nuns do the eight Mahayana precepts, even though we have them, but they're not the exact same because the motivation is different. So, you know, your motivation for these is to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. And it adds all this power to what you're already trying to do and what you might already have vows for in a different context. So it, it's, it's quite interesting to kind of layer your practice in this way and deepen it in this way by really bringing in that Mahayana motivation. So then what's the difference between and the sources for the five refuge precepts and the eight Mahayana precepts? So the five refuge precepts are the precepts that you can opt to take when you officially become a card carrying Buddhist. Yeah, when you officially become a card carrying Buddhist and you do your refuge ceremony, probably with a Lama, sometimes they give you a special name, sometimes it's too big a group and they don't have time. That ceremony where you become a Buddhist, you can opt to take five vows or any of the five vows. And they're not to kill, not to steal, not to lie, not to engage in sexual misconduct as opposed to celibacy, and then the branch of intoxicants. So those are the five lay vows. And you see that there's four repeats in these eight Mahayana precepts, but it's actually not the same practice. So um, just kind of clarifying the distinction between those two. So the source is different, first of all. So the practice of the near abiding Pradamoksha method or the five refuge precepts, Pradamoksha just means individual liberation. The method comes from the Sutra of Damse Nejo, whereas the Mahayana restoring and purifying ordination, which is the eight Mahayana precepts, is taken from a tantric text, Donjung Jimo. So both are from the Buddha, but the Buddha gave these at different times and in different contexts. So there's different source for these two, even though it's both from the Buddha. The five lay vows cannot be taken by those with ordination of renunciation. So rub jung or anything higher. So monks and nuns don't take lay vows because they are individual liberation vows that are lower than their individual liberation vows. But the Mahayana ones, the eight Mahayana precepts, can be taken by monks and nuns, even fully ordained Vajra masters. So that's a distinction. They're different in terms of motivation and result. And this is the biggest one. This is the most important one to understand. So the five lay vows, these near abiding Pratamoksha vows in their technical phrasing, they're taken in dependence upon the attitude of seeking nirvana. So the sorrowless state for oneself alone right? The state beyond sorrow, nirvana, liberation. That's your reason for taking the five lay vows. And the result of taking the five lay vows is nirvana, eventually. The, the Amahyana precepts, or these fast day vows, restoring and purifying ordination, there's lots of different ways of phrasing them. They're taken with the attitude of bodhicitta, 
which is definitely achieving enlightenment for the sake of others. So enlightenment and nirvana are not the same thing. There are different goals. And so you have different vows for different goals. You have different reasons for your vows and that leads to different results. Yeah, so this, this is a subtle distinction and it may or may not be important to you, but the goal of nirvana, also called liberation, is full of warmth and kindness towards all sentient beings, but it doesn't take this personal responsibility to work for their welfare, right? It wants to be a kind, good person. It doesn't want to hurt anyone and it is completely free from suffering for yourself. But what's different between nirvana liberation and enlightenment Buddhahood is that enlightenment Buddhahood is freeing yourself from sorrow in order to teach and show and support all sentient beings to do the same. So it's fundamentally altruistic. And it also takes personal responsibility to engage in helping others free themselves from suffering. It's not passive, it's active. So rather than just non-harmfulness with kindness, it's non-harmfulness with proactive benefiting. Another difference between nirvana and enlightenment is that enlightenment carries with it full omniscience. So you've completely removed all cognitive obscurations in their seeds, which means you're precisely able to see what sentient beings need. Right now, what sentient beings need, for us, it's like an educated guess, isn't it? You know, someone is sad, what do you do? Some want a hug, some want space. Yeah, some want to chat, some want silence. Some want company, some want, want you to go away. You don't know what someone needs when they're sad. You can only make an educated guess. Wouldn't it be wonderful to know? Wouldn't it be wonderful to know precisely in this case, in this time with this person, here is what they need, or here is what they're open to hearing. You know, it's like you could have the best advice in the world, but it doesn't matter if the person's not open to it. So you would know if there was an opening or not. You would know what way of phrasing things would get to their heart or not. This is why we want Buddhahood, full enlightenment, is so that we can directly benefit sentient things. And kind of the classic way to benefit sentient beings is to teach the Dharma itself because the Dharma is the medicine you use to free yourself. So you're not force feeding people the medicine. You're just saying, here it is, take it or leave it. Just as the Buddhas are saying to us, here it is, take it or leave it. But if you take it, you'll free yourself from suffering. Yeah, if you apply the Dharma methods, you will free your mind from pain etc right etc so the eight Mahayana precepts are higher vows than the five lay precepts does that make sense they're higher vows because they're for a different reason from a different source and place yeah and that difference between nirvana liberation and buddhahood enlightenment that's clear enough i know some of you already know that but just to make sure it's clear because sometimes they get used as if they're synonyms Okay. All right, so this is kind of the obvious, but you know, the five lay vows are five in number. <laughs> the five are five, oh, or any combination of the five. So with the five lay vows, it's your choice which ones to take. If you're not ready to take no intoxicants, you don't take no intoxicants. Yeah, so then you have four vows instead of five. You can take any combination when it's the five lay vows, these precepts. But the eight Mahayana precepts, the, these have to be taken as a set. It's all of them or none of them. The five lay vows are for life. Yeah, when you take the five lay vows, they're for life. And hopefully they plant the seeds for you to take them life after life after life. The eight Mahayana precepts are just 24 hours. Okay, so this, these are some really obvious but important key differences to just know when you're looking at these two sets. Any questions there? Yeah, good. Yeah. All right, so we're, you know, bearing that in mind, um, benefits. 
yes, we have many, many benefits. And um, there was one question in the chat, can you keep the eight longer than 24 hours? Um, so the eight Mahayana precepts are just for 24 hours, but you could take them day after day after day. <laughs> yeah, so some people, once they've received the lineage from a guru, so the first time they take it from a, you know, real live flesh and blood Lama, then you have the lineage, you have the connection with the lineage, you have, you know, you have that connection. So you don't need to do it with the Lama every single time. You can do it by yourself in your house and you're reinforcing and reconnecting with that lineage. Lots of people when they're in retreat do precepts, you know, five days a week or seven days a week, or maybe for the whole retreat. Um, when you do the practice of Nungne, this Chenrezig fa fasting practice, you take precepts every day um, in even more strict form. So it's, um, it's lovely to do them back to back days, but I think it's important to look at our life and our pacing and to make sure that there's not like any subtle problematic behaviors coming in. Like if you have an eating disorder, then you do this practice day after day with eating only one meal day after day. And your reason is not renunciation, it's body dysmorphia. That's an important self-knowing, you know? So it's like, just make sure you don't, um, that mind training slogan, don't turn gods into demons, meaning don't take something that's healthy and beneficial and beautiful and use it to reinforce your own neuroses. Don't mix in associations you might have from your upbringing. Like I have to do this because I am bad and this is the way I will be good. Don't get weird, right? <laughs> don't, don't do it for those reasons. Do it because it's joyful way to support your life and your practice. And for many of us, structure helps us focus. Structure helps us be more disciplined. Structure helps us have more power in our life. And so by committing to and making promises about things that we already value and try to live by, that added commitment brings added clarity and you're less likely to be distracted and pull off, off track. So, so those are good reasons. You know, wanting merit to achieve enlightenment more quickly, to benefit sentient beings more quickly, excellent motivation. So always keep coming back again and again to what is my actual reason? Not what I know the reason should be, but what is my actual reason? And can I adjust it to what it's supposed to be? Or am I actually lying to myself and I need to set that practice aside until I gather more internal resources? Yeah. But yeah, I mean, some people just do it twice a month on the new moon and the full moon, especially if they live at a Dharma center where groups do it all together. Some people just do it once a year, you know, like Yom Kippur or something, you know? So really it can be one of these things that becomes a very flexible thing. You can weave into your life as it feels organic to do so. Um, but once you have the lineage from a teacher, it does add power and connection to it. But again, do it in its, you know, training wheels form by yourself in your room with no one there, but your Buddhist statue. And that's still very powerful. Okay. okay, so I'm gonna talk about the benefits of each and then I'll go through the ceremony itself. So you're kind of oriented to what will actually happen in the room with the Lama. So the benefits of abandoning the taking of life. In this life and in all future lives, One's life will be long, magnificent, and free from illness. Now, with all of these, there is like, read the fine print, <laughs> you know, read the fine print in the sense of we cannot add years to our life, but we can purify the karma of untimely death. Yeah, so, you know, when in our previous life, whatever projecting karma threw us into this body, we already had a certain number of years this body could live. So we can't tack on extra years, but we might have some completing karma to like, you know, have sudden untimely death like illness or accident, and that can be purified. And when you take a vow not to kill, it plants the seed for long life for the future. So in your future lives, you're gonna have fewer life obstacles, fewer sickness, fewer tendencies to take the lives of others. The benefits are almost infinite. So just that one little vow not to kill, so powerful. 
And it's interesting because most of us are not serial killers anyway, right? You think, what is the point in saying I will not kill when you already don't? But again, that promise makes power, that merit creates such a momentum leading towards your goal. It's such a difference between incidentally not harming and not killing and proactively not harming and not killing. Once you have the vow, you are actively refraining, even though that sounds kind of strange, actively refraining every second of every day that you have that vow. So if it's a lay vow, it's for life. If it's the 24 hour vow, it's for all 24 hours, even while you're sleeping. So the merit accumulated is so vast as opposed to just incidentally not killing things. It's a lot more passive and it has less power. So with all of these, there's these kind of like fantastical statements and they are true, but there's nuance. And of course, karma is a complicated thing. So the benefit of abandoning, taking that which is not given or stealing in this and all futures lives, one will have perfect enjoyments and others will not harm them. So this is coming from the commentary by Trijong Rinpoche. And to say perfect enjoyments means the resources you need to practice the path. Yeah, the outer resources, the inner resources, you know, enough food, enough lodging, enough support financially, but also access to resources like books and communities and things like that. The benefits of abandoning the sexual act and all sexual activity is that in this life and in all future lives, one will have a good body with a beautiful complexion and complete sense organs. So again, it's not like this is like a terrible thing to, to get up to, but because of how much attachment we have to this act and how much we objectify the bodies of ourself and others under the influence of this act, it becomes quite a problematic thing. So we're not saying something heavy, like it's sinful. We're not saying that. We're saying that because of all of the associations we have around this act, it often becomes problematic. And so consciously refraining from it now and again can be very healthy for us. Even if you're not particularly active in this realm anyway, consciously refraining from it can kind of help you have a circuit breaker with the way in which you objectify the bodies of yourself and others, the way in which you kind of crave and grasp and, and get a little bit animal brain about these things. Yeah. And then the benefits of abandoning lies in this and in all future lives, one will not be cheated and others will heed what one says. One's speech will continually make the sound of Dharma. So th this one always really strikes me because I think we've all had moments in our life where we've had something important to say, but no one was listening. Even when we were telling the truth, even when we were being articulate, for some reason, people just could not hear us. And this is the result of previous karma of lying. Yeah, so in past lives, we've lied. So we've created the cause for our speech to have less power and to be less believed. And so when you take a vow not to lie, it really adds power back to your voice and your speech so that when you do have something important to say, people are gonna listen to you. People are gonna trust you because you've created the causes for that. Um, and speech is such a huge part of our everyday life. I think that's something really important to sit with. So even if you really are not a big liar in this life or you've grown out of it or it's not a problematic thing, there have still probably been times where you've wondered why people weren't paying attention to the important thing that you were saying. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's some old lying karma still playing out. So it helps to, one, change the habit so you don't lie in the future, but two, helps to purify that old stuff that still keeps kind of coming back up. Yeah. So that's true for all of these. You know, it helps change the habit, but also creates the cause for a much better future that's more supportive to your path. So the benefits of abandoning intoxicants, um, is that in this life and all future lives, one will have stable mindfulness and awareness, clear senses and perfect wisdom. So the urge to be intoxicated, to
to have the mind altered, to disassociate, to lose clarity. You know, these things are very normal, especially when we're overwhelmed, whether we're, you know, getting ourselves distracted by silly things on television or it's actually a chemical substance. That urge is very normal, but to try and gently but consistently override the tendency to not be present and to not be clear. Because the more present and clear, the more stable our ethics are gonna be. The more kind we're gonna be, the fewer mistakes we'll have, all of these things. So those are the immediate benefits. But then in the future, it's gonna be easier for us to have stable mindfulness and awareness, et cetera. Uh, the benefits of abandoning large and high beds and thrones. In this life and in all future lives, one will receive praise and respect from others. One will have proper bedding, soft, warm, whatever is needed. And one will have vehicles and animals for traveling. So this is very cute. Yes, it's very cute. But really it's talking about if you stop having pride, people will respect you. And it's counterintuitive, but it's true. You know how it is to be around someone really arrogant. Do you want to praise someone who's really arrogant? Do you want to validate them? No, that's the, like you think you're fine, <laughs> you know, run away. Um, but you know, to think the less pride we have, the more we kind of invite positive feedback, the more we invite support because people don't have to navigate around our horrible ego, you know? So, you know, just kind of thinking about that in terms of the psychological benefits of abandoning pride, but then materially, you're going to get the support you need as well. It's kind of an interesting one. So, let's see. Um, the benefits of abandoning food at the improper times. So in this life and all future lives, one will have abundant and perfect crops and will obtain food and drink without effort. So having just a bit more intention and mindfulness around our food, about consciously stopping, about not indulging in, you know, activities of greed and, you know, kind of not indulging our, our attachment mind that just kind of is always hungry for something for the senses, whether it's actual food or it's hungry for the eyes to be stimulated or the ears to be stimulated to kind of rein it in, you're gonna have more abundance. Yeah, and so it's, it's something really important to kind of sit with is what is my relationship to resources and what is my relationship to feeling craving or my a relationship to feeling abundance, you know? It's a kind of an invitation to examine those things. Uh, the benefits of abandoning perfume ornaments and so forth. In this life and in all future lives, one's body will have a pleasant scent, color, odor, and shape, and many auspicious marks. And the benefits of abandoning singing and dancing. In this life and in all future lives, one will have a subdued body and mind, and one's speech will continually make the sound of Dharma. So again, those were attachment related. Um, it's okay to sing and dance for a good reason or not to be swept away with kind of a, a, I guess, attachment nostalgia stuff or performative stuff, um, but uh, to kind of refrain from it, doing it in the wrong way, adds more clarity. So those are the benefits of those precepts. Um, do, you have, do you have some kind of thoughts or impressions from looking at that kind of traditional presentation? Again, that was from Tri Zhang Rinpoche, and he usually has very accurate sources, usually from Sutra. Um, there's other commentaries, there's contemporary commentaries out there as well. The most popular one, um, I think from the 80s, is by Lama Yeshi called The Direct and Unmistaken Method, and that talks about precepts in a lot of depth. The Direct and Unmistaken Method, I think you can get the PDF free online. Um, so anyway, benefits, any, any impressions to share or questions about that? I thought it was wonderful to see what you could really accomplish. And it really explained a lot about um, the results mm -hmm. that you could expect and how it would make a difference. So you're a great teacher, by the way. Oh, so thank you. <laughs> Thanks.
Thanks. Yeah, no, it's 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 a fascinating practice, and karma, you know, is so elaborate, and it's there's so many nuances to karma, but sometimes it helps to kind of tune into like the simple things that you can achieve through these practices and give yourself some inspiration. And there's often a very obvious logic you can touch when reading those commentaries where you see why that might be the case because it's it's related, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, go ahead. And I just had one, I just wanna clarify, you really shouldn't take these precepts until you've taken them, received them from a Lama first, right? Well, it, it's, there's two schools of thought. One school of thought is um, it misses power and connection to the teacher and lineage if you haven't done that first. So, you know, do it with the Lama first and then ever after you can do with or without, doesn't matter. Uh, the other school of thought is you can kind of ease your way into it by just doing it on your own with your altar, just reading through the practice in English at your own speed and kind of get used to it. And it still has power and benefit. You know, okay. it still has power and benefit. So if you wanted to experiment, just doing it quietly in front of your own home altar for a day, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, it's acceptable, it's permissible, you're allowed to. The only reason why people wouldn't is just because they would feel like it's missing some connection and power, but in a way it can kind of help get you oriented so that when you actually take it with a teacher, it, it really goes in because you know what you're doing already. You know, you're not learning it as you're connecting with it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, really it's up to you. And when you do it with the Lama, inevitably you're going to be lost in certain places and that's, that's fine. Just kind of go with the flow and be open and just see what happens. Um, but you can always read the text in English ahead of time, just so you're kind of oriented in case it goes into all Tibetan very fast. Okay, that's very, uh, thanks for that ex explanation. Um, I'd like to play with that a little bit. Yeah. Because yeah. I haven't really decided who, who do I want to be my teacher? I'm not sure about that. Yeah. Who's that gonna be, so. Okay. Well, and for now you got the Buddha, so that that'll do. There you <laughs> right. go. You got the Buddha. You go. And um, you can find this practice, um, Lama Yeshi Wisdom Archive. Just type okay. in eight Mahayana precepts and the text will um, show itself quite quickly, I'm sure, in the search results. So Lama Yeshi Wisdom Archive. Okay. And um, it's also in the FPMT retreat prayer book and the volume one prayer book. Um, so if you're ever at Matripa, I'm sure they have those prayer books you can page through. Okay, very good. Thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. Um, Kristen was asking, would you recommend trying to do the practice at least once a month post taking the original lineage connection? I would say if it makes you happy, yes. I hesitate to put pressure on yourself, but if it's inspired happy pressure, of course, please do. Um, and it helps reinforce the connection and maybe it keeps it fresh in your mind. So there's definitely a really good idea there that you're touching. I just, I just worry that if you put kind of a, now I have to do it every month and you put a pressure on yourself, whenever you kind of feel like you have to about anything, even if it's something you love, as soon as you bring in, I have to, there's often a subtle rebellion. <laughs> <laughs> or an angst or something that you kind of invite as soon as you put that pressure on yourself. So if you just feel like, how about I want to do this every month afterwards, want instead of should or have to, or, you know, frame it in such a way that it doesn't feel like pressure, it feels like joy. Okay, so I'll now show you the, the ceremony itself. Yeah, the ceremony itself. In the ceremony itself, there's some preliminary prayers which are probably familiar to you. Sometimes the Lama will do them, sometimes he'll skip over them. So just kind of, you know, be ready for anything with the Lama. It's kind of at their discretion and their schedule and time frame, how quick or short they do. The preliminary prayers um, are the classics and we'll do them in just a second. There's some sections in the text where you're asked to kneel on your right knee. Now, whenever you see something that asks you to kneel on your right knee, if you can't because your knees hurt, don't feel like you're a failure, <laughs> okay? It's, it's really about just adopting a posture of respect, and this was a traditional posture of respect back in ancient India. So if you just adopt a respectful attitude and put your two palms together with this kind of prostration, 
that's totally fine. If you um, have a cushion ready to kneel, if you feel like you can kneel, but you need a cushion, you know, it's just be really practical. Never force yourself to do something that is going to hurt your body, because what's the point of that? And no one will be offended. So I just want to make sure I say that because I've seen people do this in precepts class, precepts where they feel like they have to because everyone is. The Lama does not want you to hurt yourself. You know, they do not, that is the last thing they want. So, um, so don't feel like you're being rude or anything if you can't. So anyway, that's the aside about kneeling on your right knee. Only do it if it's not going to hurt you. And actually, if you don't, then a few other people with knee issues will be like, oh, thank goodness, I don't have to either. So <laughs> be a model for the team if it's not your style. Okay. Or if your knees are hurting. So here's the ceremony. And this is from the um, FPMT retreat prayer book, which is a nice PDF to get. You can get it off the um, FPMT website if you ever want it. Um, so you start with just refuge. Yeah. And this is the, the refuge prayer that is tying into the relationship between the teacher and them being kind of the gateway for the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha for you or the catalyst for you engaging with the Dharma. And then Bodhicitta, because these are the eight Mahayana precepts. So Mahayana and Bodhicitta always go together. And it's, um, it's a nice version of the prayer. Do it three times. And then the purifying the place. And, the, and you make some offerings. Those that are actually there in the gompa at the time and those that you visualize mentally. And you kind of hold that visualization of many, many offerings while you do the offering cloud mantra. Then you do the extensive power of truth. And all of this um, that isn't in the bold, this is all the Tibetan phonetics, if you're not used to seeing Tibetan phonetics. So like Kun Shosumgi Dempadang, which my terrible accent, excuse my terrible accent. Um, Probably the Lama will do it in Tibetan and you repeat after them. But as I said before, sometimes they'll have someone reciting it in English at the same time or afterwards. Um, it really depends on the situation. And then we get this invocation section. And this is always very intriguing to me because you're basically asking all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas to come to the space where you're doing the practice, which is ironic because they're already there. Yeah, why are you inviting them if they're already there? Yeah, you're saying, please come here. And they're like, I've been here the whole time. Yeah. But by doing this invocation prayer, what you're saying is, I acknowledge that you're already here and I invite connection. So they want to connect from their side all the time. All the Buddhists do is try to benefit sentient beings, but we lack receptivity. You know, our heart gets blocked or our mind gets distracted and we don't feel the presence of the divine. Yeah, and it's not because it's not there, it's because we get shut off. So these invocation prayers, this is really just an invitation for us to open up to what is there. So by sort of calling them in, it's more like you're opening to their presence. That makes sense? Yeah. Okay, so we got the invocation. And then you'll have this prayer and praise with prostrations. Om Namo Manjushriye, Nama Sushriye, Nama Otama Shriye Soha. And this is three long prostrations together. And it'll be towards the altar, towards the Lama. And when you do a full length prostration, again, don't do it if it hurts. It's completely fine to just stand. If you can't stand, sit, but just two palms together. This is a prostration. Your thumbs in, your two palms together. That is a prostration. You can also do a sh short prostration, you know, crown, throat, heart, like that, or crown, third eye, throat, heart, some do. And you put your two hands down, and then you put your two knees down, and then you put your head down. Yeah, and up and down three times, that's a short prostration. Or you go all the way down, yeah, so hands, and then you can slide, or you can do it depending on the floor and the surface that you're on, right? You can do a little step forward and all the way down, flat on your face, all the way down, and then all the way back up, long prostrations. So really, this is, again, tying in what our body does with what our mind can do, 
which is to defeat pride, it helps to have a kind of a subordinate prop, a posture, but you're not thinking I am low, the Buddhas are high. You're thinking I respect what I will become. These Buddhas that exist, this teacher that is here shows me my potential. I'm prostrating to them who have already completed the path and I'm showing respect to my own mind that can do the same but recognizes that right now I have afflictions that block that process. And one of the afflictions that blocks my process is my pride that thinks I already know everything or I'm better than this or whatever. And pride is subtle and sneaky because you can have self-loathing and pride at the same time. It sounds like a contradiction, but it's all about your kind of expectations of yourself and how you should be. So kind of going, flat on the floor all the way down is so good for your pride. But the psychology is you become receptive to what you respect. You become receptive to what you respect. And so by adopting these postures, you're becoming open to the person giving you the precepts to the altar and what it represents. And all of these things, you're more open to them because you're really saying, I need some help here. I have not finished my path yet. And so it shouldn't ever feel like an act of self-deprecation or an act of putting oneself down. It should feel like an empowered posture that is overcoming your pride. You are not your pride. Pride is a problem, but you are not your pride. You know, and just again and again, we have to de-identify from our negative states of mind because then when we do actions to squash them, it doesn't feel like self-harm all of the afflictions are removable. So these prostrations, you know, these three are usually done full length, but again, some people just stand with prostration mudra. Some people do short ones. There's gonna be variations. So again, don't feel pressure. Just do what feels right for you at the time. Even if it's completely mental, that's, that's fine because the main point is mental. And sometimes you'll do another round. It depends on the teacher saying this phrase to the Shakyamuni Buddha himself. And then you sit down and do the seven limb prayer. And the seven limb prayer comes up in almost every practice that we do. And it's accumulating merit and clearing and purifying negative karma and you know amplifying the positive karma that we already have and creates the cause for us to meet the, the teachers again and again in every life and creates the cause for them to teach again and again in every life. So this seven limb prayer just will keep coming up again and again. And we offer a short mandala and the inner mandala. And now <laughs> this is the official start. And here you stand up, you make three short prostrations and kneel on your right knee with your hands together in prostration. And you can recite this verse. So again, don't do it if it hurts. It's about mental attitude. And the visualization is Guru Avalokiteshvara before you. So if you're doing this by yourself, you can visualize thousand arm Chenrezig in the space in front, one in nature with your root guru or one in nature with Shakyamuni Buddha. If you're not familiar with Guru Avalokiteshvara, Chenrezig, then just normal Buddha Buddha is fine. Yeah, but the Buddha of compassion is the one that we direct our attention to in this particular case. Okay, so here is the actual prayer. And if the Lama is doing it, um, is offering the precepts, he'll, he'll do like Kunche Junpe Sange Dang, Janju Sempa Tamche Dana Gunsu So, and pause. And then you all say that line. And then line, and then you repeat the line, and then line, and then you repeat the line. Now, you know, whether there's English or not, just think what you're saying here is Buddhas, pay attention to me, just like you were once bodhisattvas, and then became Buddhas, me too. Yeah, and so this prayer is lovely, and you can read it at length at your leisure, but it's basically saying, like those who came before you and those who came before me, let me do the same. Yeah, for the welfare of all sentient beings, in order to benefit, in order to liberate, in order to eliminate famine, in order to eliminate war, in order to stop the harm of the four elements, in order to eliminate sickness, 
in order to fully complete the 37 practices harmonious with enlightenment, and in order to definitely actualize the unsurpassed result of perfect complete enlightenment, perfectly perform the restoring and purifying ordination. Similarly, also I, who am called, and you say your name, from this time until sunrise tomorrow, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this prayer is done three times. And at the end of the three time recitation, the guru will say, Tab you know, which means this is the method. And then you say, Legso in Tibetan, which means excellent. And when this happens at the very end of the third recitation, you think at that point, and often the guru will snap their fingers, at that point, the vows have entered your mental continuum. And then you rejoice. And so then you do this commitment prayer. From now on, I shall not kill, shall not steal others' possessions. I shall not engage in sexual activity or speak false words. Because many mistakes arise from intoxicants, I shall avoid intoxicants. I shall not sit on large, high, or expensive beds. I shall not eat food at the wrong times. I shall not use perfumes, garlands, or ornaments. I shall avoid singing, dancing, and playing music. Just as the arhats have avoided rock actions, such as taking the lives of others, so shall I, etc., etc. May I be released from the ocean of cyclic existence. So up here is when you actually took all these vows. This part is just reinforcing it and becoming you know, specific. And this one is only recited once. And then we get this prayer of pure morality. And this is the one that if you break any of the vows during the day, this is the one that you say 21 times to purify and restore those vows right away. The mantra of pure morality. So during the actual ceremony, you will be saying this 21 times. And the visualization is that streams of white nectar light come from Chenrezig, um, Avalokiteshvara, the Buddha in front of you, and stabilize and protect your mind. Stabilize the vows, protect your mind, and um, you just kind of think that takes the form of white light, blessings, and light as you say that mantra. And if you can't visualize, it's no big deal. But that Durrani of Immaculate Morality, that's the key one to make sure you know exists in case you break any of them during the day, because then you'll get all fixed up. And then uh, prayer, may I maintain faultless morality of the rules and immaculate morality. May the perfection of moral conduct be completed by keeping morality purely and untainted by pride. And then you make three prostrations again, whether mentally or physically. And you think this is my contribution to the peace and happiness of all sentient beings. And in particular to the peace and happiness of all sentient beings of this world. And then just the regular dedications, yeah. And some people do lots of dedications. Some of the lamas do just a few dedications, but the whole ceremony often takes like 20 minutes. It's not very long, sometimes shorter if they just go straight to that middle section. Um, some teachers like Lama Zuparimshe might give a little commentary before or interwoven with, and then it's longer, but I'm guessing that when, when Jada Rimshe offers it, it's probably not going to be that long, though he might do a talk after. Who knows what will happen? But um, when you do it by yourself in your room, 20 minutes, easy, no problem. Questions about the ceremony? No? You may or may not have the text in front of you. It really depends. Um, you just kind of go with the flow. The main thing is bodhicitta, bodhicitta. I'm keeping these vows for 24 hours. I'm keeping these vows for 24 hours. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, any miscellaneous questions before we call it a night? You feel oriented? Um, Kristen says, uh, do we know if the ceremony will have English translation? I don't know. Um, you'll have to ask the Matripa folks. They might know. Um, go with the flow. I'm guessing it'll be Tibetan if Jada Rinpoche is offering it, and there might be somebody translating it also, but it's probably going to be Tibetan or Tibetan and English. Yeah, but Namdril, do you know? Are you there? Yeah, just find out in the moment. <laughs> I'm here, I'm coming. Hold on. Sorry. Technical difficulties. 
Oops. And it's oh. okay if you don't speak Tibetan, you just do your best. Oh no, you can only come to this ceremony if you speak Tibetan. <laughs> yes, of course it will be translated. Yes, it will be. Geshe Tashi, who's um, Rumche's Jod Rumche's longtime attendant, is also translates for Rumche periodically into English. So he will be translating and present at everything. But it probably will, as Venerable Yantan mentioned, go pretty fast. Usually it goes like that, and they don't explain anything. So just do your best. Bodhicitta, bodhicitta. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, anything else, folks, but, um, before we dedicate? Yeah, good. All right. Well, thanks so much. And um, I hope that that was clear. And uh, I hope that you will do precepts in your life at some point, hopefully many, many times. It's a beautiful thing. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that is not arisen arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. May the precious view of emptiness that is not arisen arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. The wish granting, wish fulfilling jewel, source of every single benefit and happiness in this world, the incomparably kind Supreme Tenzin Gatso, may you have a long life and all your holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. You who uphold the subduer's moral way, who serve as the bountiful bearer of all, sustaining, preserving, and spreading Manjinoth's victorious doctrine, who masterfully accomplish magnificent prayers honoring the three sublime ones, savior of myself and others, your disciples, please, please live long. Embodiment of the three divine refuges who bless us all, Gendon Tenzin, holder of the teachings, may your lifespan last for eternity. May your excellent deeds pervade all of time and space and continuously ripen for the nourishment of myself and others. Okay, thanks everyone. Thank you everyone. Thank you so much, Venerable Yuntin. That was lovely, thank you. Thank you. Good night. Very grateful. Good night everyone.